All right, hello and welcome to my BEST Algebra EOC practice exam. This is a 13 question algebra practice exam designed to prepare you for the actual EOC exam at the end of the year, which is in about a month from now. My hope is that I can provide some extra test resources for everyone so you get more out of this upcoming month of study leading up to the exam. Um, if we can cover as much material as possible over this month, there's a higher likelihood that you will see something that we've covered here. Uh, and that way, when you get to that question in your actual EOC exam, you can say, hey, I've seen this, and I remember how to do it, and knock it out. And the more questions that happens for, the better grade you get. So um, like I said, we've got 13 questions. We're going to go into a pretty good amount of detail for each of these questions, and hopefully that will provide you with the background you need. Uh, to answer similar questions on the test. Um, this is a long form video, so stick with me. We've got um, about an hour and change here. Uh, feel free to watch in multiple parts, come back to this later, um, and hopefully by the end you'll feel more confident. Um, one more thing, in the next several weeks, uh, I'm going to begin posting shorter form videos. I wanna keep this entire test in one location because this is the official BEST Algebra 1 exam. Uh, but as I continue to cover more and more material for this test, I'm going to break it up into smaller chunks, maybe four or five questions versus the whole 15 or however many question exam we have here. And that way you can jump in, look at some math questions, and then feel more confident. And we'll do that several times a week, hopefully. We're gonna be posting at least two to three times a week. So stay tuned and let's dive right into this exam. All right, here we go. Question number one. Doug has eight square pieces of wood. Each piece of wood has a side length of S centimeters. And the total area of all eight pieces of wood is 200 square centimeters. So this 200 square centimeters means that we need to find the area of this piece of wood with side length S. So what do we know about a square? We know that all the side lengths are going to be the same. And as with any rectangle, if we take, oops, if we take uh, the area, we know the area is going to be base times height. For a square, that is going to be S times S, which is S squared. So we know the area of each individual square here is S squared. And we're also told that there are eight of these squares. So I have I have eight squares that have an area of S squared each. And the total area, that is to say this number is equal to 200. This answer here that I've written up in the top right, this is probably an acceptable answer. I would put this in standard form uh, for this particular. They don't specify anywhere. If you look at the inst instruction set, they just say create a quadratic equation. And they don't specify in standard form, but I would just put this in standard form just in case. Um, so we have 8s squared minus 200 equals 0. Standard form, you should know by now, is ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. So that's why when I had this original equation, I simply subtracted 200 from the right and from the left, and that forced the function here into standard form. So that's question number one. Okay, question number two. We have a band selling X premium tickets and Y regular tickets for a concert. A premium ticket costs $20, and a regular ticket costs $5 less than a premium ticket. Before we do anything, let's identify the cost of a regular ticket, because they're not giving it to us, but we can figure it out. Premium ticket is $20. Regular ticket is $5 less. That means that our regular ticket should be 15 And then we're told the band raises $21.45 from these ticket sales. 
So select coefficients to complete the equation representing the relationship between x and y. We're given here x, which if we look back at the question, my x variable is the premium ticket count. So the number of premium tickets is x, and notice here that I'm going to end up with a dollar value. This 2145 is the dollar total. So each of these terms here and here should be dollar amounts. So if we have x being the count of tickets, we know that this has to be a dollar value, and specifically it's a dollar value that represents the cost per ticket. Because if we multiply the number of tickets sold times the cost per ticket, we're going to get the total dollar amount for the premium ticket sales. And we identified here, premium ticket cost $20, so this number, this is a drop down that has several answers. 20 is one of them. And then um, for the next section here, the next drop down, we have the same thing. We're going to want some dollar amount. And we know again y is our regular ticket costs, or sorry, regular ticket count. And we know, <coughs> excuse me, we know that our ticket count times our ticket price, which we identified up here as 15, gives us the total dollar amount for the regular ticket sales. So similar idea here, if we multiply our $15 per regular ticket times the ticket count for regular tickets, we get the dollar amount for the regular ticket sales. And this 20 and 15, 20x plus 15y equals 2145 is the final answer, this is the equation representing the relationship between x and y. Okay, question number three. We are told to enter an expression to make the following a true equation. And we are given x, y, z all squared minus one is equal to something that we're gonna find times, in parentheses, x, y, z minus one. Uh, this entire question is a little bit sneaky. It's designed to test whether you are able to identify that this guy is a difference of squares. Why is he a difference of squares? Well, let's take a look at the two components here, x, y, z squared. Obviously this is squared. And the bit of a sneaky part is one equals one squared. So definitionally here, I have two things that are squared and I am taking the difference of them. We can directly use the difference of squared equation, difference of squares equation, which is, if I write it out here, a squared minus b squared is equal to a plus b a minus b. If we think about this in our context, what is a and b here? If we go left to right, my a is equal to x, y, z, because it is the thing being squared. Here, x, y, z, parentheses squared is the first is in this first slot here. It is the first term of the left-hand side of the equation. And the x, y, z is what's getting squared. So that's my a. And b here is just one because the thing getting squared is that one. So again, same logic. Um, if we use the difference of squares equation for a and b, we can then say um, x, y, z squared minus one is equal to, and then we can plug in for a and b. We're going to use this equation for these values of a and b. 
So we have x, y, z plus 1, x, y, z minus 1. And now we're going to compare this final equation to our initial given equation to figure out where we need to plug things in. So x, y, z squared minus 1 was the entire left-handed equation that's given. And now on the right-hand side, we have two factors. We have x, y, z minus 1, which is that portion of the right-hand side of the equation. And then we have this guy, x, y, z plus 1. And that is missing, and it goes inside of that parenthesis. So the answer to this question is x, y, z plus 1. And that is the final answer for question number three. OK. Question number four, we have a function f of x equals 2x plus 1, and we are to select all the effects on the graph of this function when f of x is multiplied by 3. So I am going to start off by defining a new function g of x and set it equal to this 3 times f of x. This is equal to 3 times 2x plus 1 which is equal to 6x plus 3. And now what I'm saying here is I'm going to compare when I say something increases or decreases, that's in reference to going from f of x to g of x. So let's look at these questions individually here. So x intercept increases or decreases. Actually, these are broken into three separate columns. So we're going to look at the x intercept the y-intercept, and then we're going to look at the slope. So how I would solve this problem is I'm going to solve uh, all three of the points of interest, the x-intercept, the y-intercept, and the slope, and then see how they compare. So for f of x, what is the x-intercept? So we have, for x-intercept, we're going to set y, or in this case f of x, equal to 0. And we're going to solve for x. Subtract 1 from both sides, and then divide by 2. And we directly have x equals negative 1 half as the x-intercept for f of x. And now for the x-intercept of g of x, which is the x-intercept after we multiply by 3, we have the same thing. We're going to swap. 0 into g of x, and we get 0 equals 6x plus 3. Subtract 3 from both sides, and we get negative 3 equals 6x, and we're going to divide both sides by that 6. And here we have, again, x equals negative 3 over 6, which is negative 1 over 2. So both f of x and g of x share an x-intercept. So when we go from f of x to g of x, the x-intercept is neither going to increase nor decrease. So actually, I'm not going to check either of these boxes. The x-intercept does not change. So we're, we don't have an option for that, so we don't need to mark anything. So let's move on to question to this, the second column. Not question two, but the second column here, the y-intercept portion. So if you'll notice, both of these functions, both f of x and g of x, I'll rewrite g of x here, g of x are both in slope-intercept form. Slope-intercept form is y equals mx plus b, where m is slope and b is the y-intercept. So when we come into this column and we see we're comparing the y-intercept between f of x and g of x, I can directly inspect this point, pardon me, this slope-intercept form and see my y-intercept is 1 for f of x, and for g of x, my y-intercept is equal to 3. So between f of x and g of x, which is to say, 
after I multiply f of x by 3, the y-intercept is going to increase, which is this top option here, because it goes from 1 to 3. And now we can look at the final column, which again is made easy by the fact that this, both f of x and g of x are in uh, slope-intercept form, and we can directly see what the slope is. If I look here, my slope is going to be equal to that 2. And on g of x, my slope is going to be equal to that 6 right there. So slope equals 2, slope equals 6. We can see here that from f of x to g of x, the slope is going to be increasing from 2 to 6. And this is the comprehensive list of things to bubble. Everything else is false, and we can move on to the next question. Okay, for number five, we have the equation for the function f is shown, and our job is to graph a quadratic equation g that has some properties. So let's take a look at the conditional statements that have been laid out, starting with the first one. I have g has a lesser y-intercept than f. Well, in order to do anything with that information, I need to know the y-intercept of f. So we can look at f of x, and we can see that this is in slope-intercept form, which is to say that my y-intercept is the constant. And in this case, I have a y-intercept of 3. So I am, for g, going to pick a lesser y-intercept than that, which is 3. So anything that you pick on the y-axis, which is less than 3, I'm going to pick y equals 0 here, the origin, as my y-intercept. Um, so that satisfies condition number 1. Let's go, actually, let's go to condition number 3. So here we have first g increases, and then it decreases. So we have two types of parabolas. We have the type of parabola that is going to open up. And then we have the type of parabola, I'm actually going to redraw this opening up like this, make it a little bigger. And then we have the type of parabola that opens down. And we need to choose the type of parabola that first increases and then decreases. <clears throat> so let's look at these. Um, for both of these guys, obviously x is increasing as you go to the right. And we need to see what is happening to y with relation to x. So here, as x increases, my y starts out by decreasing or going down. You can see that here. It's then going to reach the vertex and change direction and start going up. So here we have first decreasing behavior and increasing behavior. And we should see the opposite on the other graph. And we do here, you can see, start out by increasing. Increasing, 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 reaches the vertex, and then decreases. So here we have increasing first, then decreasing. And you can see we are looking for increases first and decreases, then decreases, rather. And that is my opening down type parabola here. So I'm going to write above the graph. Just as a reminder, we know that this is going to open down. And now let's look at the final condition. We have the maximum value and the y-intercept are not equal. OK, what does that mean? Um, what is the maximum value of a parabola that opens down? So if you look at this, the vertex here is going to be the absolute maximum value, right? Because these lines decrease forever. So the theoretical minimum value is approaching negative infinity. But the highest y value that this function will ever reach, if we assume d vertex is hk, is that k value. So the maximum value is synonymous in this case with the vertex. So I'm going to, the way I think about this is I'm going to replace maximum value with vertex. And now, what this is saying is, OK, the vertex and the y-intercept can't be the same. So what that basically means is I can't have a graph that also has a vertex 
at the origin. Because while you could do that, in general, that's what that would look like, it would not satisfy condition number two. We need to choose another vertex. So where are some acceptable vertexes here? There's actually a few. I can choose a vertex to be here. And what would that look like? If we had an opening down parabola, y-intercept there, came to the vertex and came down, this is what that would look like. Another acceptable one, if I chose a point over here, this would come up, hit the vertex, and then I missed it by a little bit, but you get the idea. Um, what are some vertexes that are not acceptable? What if I chose a vertex over here? You can see here, if I this has to open up because in order to hit the y-intercept and the vertex and be a parabola, you have to have this shape. And this is uh, not satisfying our condition number three. Um, what about if you pick a point like this? You can't have a vertex here because um, this there's basically no way for you to reach your predefined y-intercept. Basically what you're saying is there's two y-intercepts, which is not possible for a parabola. Um, so all that being said, um, anywhere in this region up here, is and anywhere in this region up here, as long as you don't place it directly on the y-axis itself, it is acceptable to put your vertex. And then like I had mentioned previously, so this, um, in a testing environment, all you have to do is place your y-intercept wherever it belongs, place your vertex wherever it belongs, I can just put it right there for now, and then the EOC actually will automatically graph this for you so you can visually inspect and say, okay, am I opening down? Yes. Is my y, you know, and again, we, we've already determined where the y-intercept belongs and the vertex we placed in an acceptable spot, so um, like I said, multiple solutions to number five, but as long as you pick a vertex in that top left or top right quadrant and a vertex, pardon me, and a y-intercept less than three, you should be good to go. So let's move on to number six. Okay, here we have question number six. We have the expression 15,000 times quantity one plus 0.02 to the m power can be used to model the sales in dollars of a company after m months. So here we already have some useful information. Anything that we plug in for that exponent is going to be a number of months. So armed with this knowledge, we go to the next portion of this question, which says the value 12 was substituted in 4m to create the expression 15,000 times 1 plus 0.02 raised to the 12th power. This 12 represents a period of time lasting 12 months. Because we know from the previous discussion that anything that we put into that exponent anything that we substitute in for that exponent has to be a number of months. So in this case, 12, we know that we're dealing with 12 months. So continuing on, we now see enter a number and select a unit to complete the following sentence. The expression quantity one plus 0.02 raised to the 12th power represents the growth factor of the company's sales and for a period of time lasting, and then we're supposed to fill some stuff in. So based on our previous discussion, we know that the period of time that we're interested in is this number is 12, and it is representing some number of months. So here we have, we're going to write in the number 12, and then inside of this drop-down menu is various uh, units of time. We're going to select months, and this is the correct answer here. Another correct answer, I don't recommend doing this, but it is technically correct. You could also say one year because 12 months and one year are the same thing. But there's no reason that I would even risk that. We've already determined that 12 months is the correct answer, so we can just roll with that for now. And we will go on directly to the next question. Okay, we have for number seven, 
a table of values for a linear function is shown. Linear function here is important because that means that we can represent this table as y equals mx plus b, which is slope intercept form and is also a linear function. So that will become relevant as we continue to find some key features. So let's go see what we're looking for. Here we are to determine my x-intercept, my y-intercept, and my rate of change. Rate of change is another way of saying slope. And if we look at the table that we're given, we can actually see directly that we are given an x-intercept because we have y equals zero, which is to say that we have hit the x-axis at that point, and the x-value that we intersected the x-axis is x equals 3. So here my x-intercept is x equals 3. Now let's solve for the slope because we're going to need the slope to find the y-intercept. So slope is equal to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. I'm going to label some of these coordinates here and I am going to plug them in. So y2 minus y1 is 6 minus 0 over x2 minus x1 is 6 minus 3. Here we have 6 over 3 which is equal to 2. So my slope should be 2, or my rate of change is 2. Both are the same thing. And now we're going to take this m and we're going to take, take it and plug it into there. So I have my linear function that is representing this data is y equals 2 times x plus b. And now in order to solve the y-intercept, which for a slope-intercept form is this b, I am going to perform some substitutions for x and y. Uh, I can choose any point on this table. I'm going to choose my x1, y1 point, which is to say my y value is 0, and my x value is 3, plus b. And now we have enough information to solve for b. We have 0 equals 2 times 3 is 6, plus that b. And now all we have to do is subtract 6 from both sides, and we get negative 6 equals b. And that is my y-intercept. So I can bubble negative 6 for the y-intercept. And that is all I needed. So we have completed question number 7. So let's go to number 8. Okay, for question number eight, we are told that the fuel economy of a car is its average distance traveled per amount of fuel consumed. And cars have different fuel economies when they are driven in the city and on the highway. A linear model of the relationship between the city and highway fuel economies of eight cars in miles per gallon is shown. And in part A, we are asked to find a linear equation that best models the scatter plot to the left. So the best thing to do here is going to be simply to plot these various linear functions on the graph to the left and see how close they match the data. Um, for this guy, for question, or sorry, for option A, I am going to plug in a x value of x equals 33 to get a good starting point. And I am going to get y equals 2 over 3 times 33 plus 19. And this is equal to 33 and 3 is going to cancel. And I'm going to get 2 times 11, which is 22, plus 19, which is 41. You can use your calculator to do this math. Uh, if you are in the testing environment. So I have a x equals 33, y equals 41, 
which is going to be a dot right there. And then because this is a linear, we're told in the question that these are all going to be linear equations. All I need to do is find one other point and I can then draw the entire linear plot. So I know that I have a slope of 2 over 3, so I can do rise to run 1, 2, 3. And if I do that again, just for simplicity, I can do this. And I can already tell that that is going to be the right answer. That is a fantastic linear model of the scatter plot. Um, however, I will tell you that in case you get something wacky, like if we had, like for example, let's do another one that's probably going to be much worse. Um, so if we do, I can already tell here that D is going to be a much worse example. So let's just do D. That way you can see it done at least two times. So here I have Y equals 8 over 6 times X plus 25. Um, by the way, the reason that I chose X equals 33 as a start point is because I looked at my X axis and determined I just chose a X value somewhere in the data set that was close to the beginning and divisible by 3 because I had a denominator of 3. So 33 was a good initial choice. You could have cho chosen 30, you could have chosen, realistically you could choose, choose anything. Um, I specifically chose a number that was going to give me easy numbers to work with. But because you have a calculator, just choose any x in this region here and you should be okay with the calculator. But that being said, so I'm going to go to D now, and I'm going to choose a x value that is divisible by 6. I'm going to choose 30, because 30 is divisible by 6, and it's towards the beginning. So I have uh, 8 over y equals, that is 8 over 6 times 30 plus 25. Again, this is going to cancel because I chose it to be a little bit easy to work with. And I have 8 times 5, which is 40, plus 25 is 65. So for part D, I have x equals 30 and y equals 65, which is actually off the graph. So we can pretty much immediately tell here that this is not going to be a particularly good linear fit model. So I obviously would, I mean, granted, I already decided that A was the best linear fit, um, but if you had started with D, you could clearly see that if I am off the graph in the positive Y direction, I probably don't have the best fit line. Uh, and it's time to move on to find another option. So let's move on to part B. Based on the model, in part A, what could be the highway fuel economy in miles per gallon of a car that has a city fuel economy of 43 miles per gallon? And it's asking us to round the answer to the nearest hundredth. So what this basically is saying is use your linear fit model that we decided was the closest here. And don't need this x equals 33 anymore. Um, so use this y equals 2 thirds x plus 19 uh, and plug in a city fuel economy of 43 miles per gallon. Um, our x, you can see here x is the city fuel economy and they're saying that we should use a city fuel economy of 43. So that is specifically saying plug in 43 for x. So let's do so. So and, and y again, if we're being, if we're looking at this, y is equal to our highway fuel economy, which is what we're solving for, right here. So we have y, which we're solving for, equals two over three times that 43 mpg city fuel economy that we're told to use, plus. 19. And now all we have to do is plug 
this into a calculator. So I'm plugging in y equals 2 over 3 times 43 plus 19. And when I plug that into a calculator, I get uh, 47.6 repeating. And we're rounding to the nearest hundredth. So I have tenths and then hundredths. I'm going to round up because it's 0.6 repeating. So I have 47.67 is my expected highway fuel economy in miles per gallon. And that completes question number eight. And let's go directly to question number nine. Okay, here we have question number nine. We see Giselle has 40 prizes for raffle ticket winners. And she's giving away two prizes each day until she runs out of prizes. The equation given as P plus 2T equals 40 represents the situation. Where P is the number of prizes after T days. So here, part A. First, we select P or T to represent the independent variable. So whenever you have a situation like this, uh, we have P representing the number of prizes after T days. Um, generally, any time variable is going to be your independent, and that's true here as well, because the number of prizes is going to depend on how many days has passed. So what we have is in your exam, you would take the P here and put it there, and you take the T there put it there. I'm actually going to move it outside of the box so it's a little bit easier to see. Now we're going to graph this. Um, we have a linear relationship here. I'm actually going to change this into point slope form. Um, pardon me, I'm actually going to change it to slope intercept form where I have p plus 2t equals 40 and I'm just going to move the independent variable over and I'm going to get minus 2t plus 40. And now we have a situation where I'm decreasing at a rate of 2 over 1. My y-intercept is 40. So I can go here and my y-intercept is 40. And this is a linear graph and I can see that at t equals 20 I'm gonna have negative 2 times 20 plus 40 P equals negative 40 plus 40 equals 0. So my at t equals 20, I'm going to have my x intercept. So I can go to 20 and mark 0. And then I have this linear relationship here. So that was part A, uh, labeling and graphing. Now we have part B, which is to enter a value in each of these boxes to describe the relationship. So the domain of this relationship is what? So what is domain? Domain refers to uh, x values to be considered. The other way to think about this is um, acceptable, acceptable x values. So in this particular equation, we have the basically time starts at t equals zero. Uh, so that's day zero. And then when she runs out, of things to give away at t equals 20, we are done with this graph. So the graph basically starts at t equals zero and ends at t equals 20. So the domain is that specific set of numbers. So it starts at zero and ends at 20. In this particular context, what this is saying is that she starts giving away toys at day zero and it stops giving away toys at day 20. And that's actually the next part of the question. So here we have Giselle will give away all the prizes after 20 days. We've already discussed that a few times because at t equals 20, 
the toys remaining is zero. So she is done giving them away at t equals 20. So that is number nine. Okay, number 10. A school office survey sixth and seventh grade students about whether they ride the bus to school. The data are recorded in a frequency table. Enter numbers to complete the frequency table for the data. So we can basically just go line by line here and see if we have enough data to solve uh, for the missing pieces. So going left to right, I have 176, six graders are riding a bus, 74 are not riding the bus. So the total of six graders that were polled in this particular data set are 176 plus 74 which is going to be 250. So I'm going to put 250 here. And now, is there anything else I can immediately see? Okay, if I look now, in the do not ride the bus column, I have 74 plus this missing value is going to equal 128. So algebraically, I can represent that as 74 plus x which is the seventh grader is not riding the bus and that's going to be 128 and i can then remove 74 from both sides and i get x equals and i'm going to use a calculator for this one just so i don't mess it up 128 minus 74 and that is going to be 54. Anything else I can see? Uh, I see, let me get rid of some of this mess. Okay. And now let's go through the total column. So here I have the total six graders that were polled to 50 plus the total seventh graders polled, which I'm going to count as X for now. And that is going to equal 400. And here I can subtract 250 from both sides, and I get x equals 150. So that 150 goes into here. And now, while I erase this, you can clearly see that I have a, another column that is done, or doable. Uh, and actually, that's a row that's doable, because I'm looking now at the 7th graders again, and I have x number of 7th graders ride the bus plus 54 do not ride the bus and that totals to 150 and here I can subtract 54 from both sides and I get x equals 96 so 96 goes here and now there's one final box to fill out which is the ride the bus column so let's one final time, do a relatively straightforward algebra problem, which is 176 right, uh, sixth graders ride the bus plus 96 seventh graders ride the bus. That total is going to be x. And for one final time, I will go to my calculator for this problem, and I will get 176 plus 96. And that total is 272. And here is the final matrix completely filled out. Um, you can see basically this was more or less just a bunch of simple addition problems. Um, but we did need to use some algebra for some of them. So this one is pretty straightforward and we'll move on to number 11. All right, for question number 11, I've actually solved this question already, and we're just going to discuss the results here. Um, if I try to draw this graph by hand, it gets ugly. So I just used the graphing tool inside of the EOC practice exam uh, in order to graph it for me, and uh, we can analyze the results here and discuss. Um, so we're given a system of inequalities. Um, this wording is important because when we get to the 
shading portion, that means that both inequality number one and inequality number two have to be true within the shaded region. Uh, we'll discuss that in part B. But uh, So we give, we're given these two inequalities and part A says select a solid or dotted boundary line for each inequality. Um, you may know that, I'll build a table down here, if I have less than or greater than without the line below them, that means we have a dot, dotted line, a dotted line. And for less than or equal to, or greater than or equal to, we have a solid line. And that's because if we do have this less than or greater than, sign, that means that the line itself is not actually to be included in the region. Um, that is why we specifically have these less than or equal to or greater than or equal to to specify that the line itself is indeed included in the region. So for inequality number one, you can see here we have a less than sign, which we know we need to have a dotted line for. So that's this guy here. And then for inequality number two, we have a greater than or equal to, which we know is a solid line, and that's why I've selected solid line right here. So that concludes part A. Let's discuss part B. So for part B, we are going to actually graph the two lines, and then we are going to figure out which region is to be shaded. So first of all when you graph an inequality um, you're basically just graphing the line as if the inequality symbol was an equal sign and then we're going to make it dotted if it's less than or greater than and then you're gonna shade depending on uh, how uh, where the true values are for that inequality but for just general graphing purposes you can set this as y equals negative x plus one just or pardon, pardon me negative x minus one for this case in order to get the line in, and that is here, we have a y-intercept of negative one, and then a slope of also negative one, so that's this line here. So I know that that line, and also it's dotted, so we know that this is inequality number one. And then the other line, by process of elimination, is inequality two, but if you wanted to graph it, you could again set that as a equal x plus one. We have a y-intercept of positive one and a slope of positive one and there's the line. So I will label this as inequality number two. So that is the graphed lines and then we've determined whether they're dotted or solid. So now we need to figure out where the shaded region is. So when you see y is less than and then you have a linear, in this case a linear graph, that means that all of the y values that are under that line are going to be included in the region. So for y is less than, basically think of less than as pointing down. Um, and if we do the opposite, here we have y is greater than or equal to, so that means for my inequality number two, we have the opposite case. We have the region above this line shaded. And like I mentioned earlier, we have a system of inequalities, which means that the shaded region has to be where both are true. So even though, for example, a point up here is true for inequality number two, it's not true for inequality number one. Inequality number one is having us go below their line. So we have to choose a region where both we are above inequality number two and below inequality number one. So that is the shaded region right here that I've shown. Um, you can test this by choosing a point inside your shaded region and you can verify by plugging that point into both inequality number one and inequality number two. And if you've chosen the correct region, both inequality number one and inequality number two will yield true statements when we substitute in our point. So what is this point? This is, I've chosen negative five, zero. So if we substitute in negative five for x and zero for y into both inequality number one and inequality number two, we should see um, 
that we get two true statements. So let's do that. So inequality number one is y less than negative x minus one and substituting in y equals zero less than negative negative five minus one we have oops we have zero less than five minus one zero is less than four that is a true statement and now we can go to inequality two where we have y is greater than or equal to x plus one and again we're going to use the same substitution we have y equals zero greater than or equal to negative five plus one we have zero greater than or equal to negative four this is also a true statement so we know that we've picked a point inside of our region that is true for this system of inequalities and as a result that point is in the shaded region and we've labeled the correct shaded region so that is how to do a system of inequalities and let's move on to question number 12. for question number 12 we're given that the table below is representing two functions function a and function b and here we have uh, x is increasing please take note that we have 0 1 and then there's a large jump to 10 and then jump to 20 that's going to affect how we process this data and inside of these drop downs are the words linear and exponential so and that's uh, inside of this box as well so what they're testing us on here is do we understand what a linear relationship is and do we understand what an exponential relationship is so a linear function is going to follow it's going to establish a slope and then it's going to follow that slope indefinitely it'll never have a different slope so let's find the slope for function a between call this x1 this x2 this y1 and this y2 and we'll use that to establish a slope and then we'll see if the slope is continues to be true across multiple values of x and y so here i have a slope of y2 minus y1 again I'm just going to generally write down the slope formula and here i have 750 minus 700 over 1 minus 0 this is going to be 50 over 1 which is just 50 and now I'm going to redo this question except for instead of finding the slope between my previous x1 and x uh, sorry uh, my, my previous coordinate 2 and coordinate 1 I'm going to shift to a new x2 y2 and reperform the slope calculation so here I have I'm not going to rewrite y2 minus y1 I'm just going to do it I have 1200 minus 700 over 10 minus 0 this will be 500 over 10 which is equal to 50 again and we could do that again but what I'm going to say is if you notice between 0 and 10 we jumped 500 and between 10 and 20 we jumped another 500 so we can tell that function a is growing linearly because function a has a slope the slope is definable it's 50 and it's following that slope throughout the table of values that we're given um, so let's take a look at function B and we're going to do the same thing and see if we can establish a slope that is going to be followed throughout the data so um, again let's just we can call this x1 x2 and we'll go y1 y2 and I'm not gonna again I'm not gonna write the definition of the slope form I'm just gonna jump right into it uh, 624 minus 600 over 1 minus 0 
and this is 24 over 0. So now if we see 24 over 1, which is 24. Um, so now we should see that this slope of 24 is going to be the same across the board. So here I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to shift my x2, y2 down. And let's reperform the slope calculation. I have 888 minus 600 over 10 minus 0. That looks like a 60. Let me rewrite that. And here I have the difference between 888 and 600 is 288 over 10. And here I have 28.8. So we can see here that the slope between these two, so the slope is actually changing as we go further along in the data set and specifically as we move along the X. So what does that look like? If I graph this, if I have a 0, 600, it's something like this, and then I have a slope that looks something like this, and then later on my slope is getting steeper and steeper. This is a classic exponential growth function. So here, function b appears to grow exponentially. I ran out of space, but you got the idea. And now, what is the next part asking? As x increases, the quantities for, and this is in here, let me make some space. So this is saying, so this second part is saying, as x increases, the quantities for which function will eventually exceed the quantities for the other function. And this is a case where if you see here, we're at 20 and function A is still larger than function B at x equals 20. However, we know that if we have a linear growth, even if I have an exponential growth that's smaller initially and for some set of values, it is going to rapidly overtake any linear progression because exponential growth is significantly faster than linear growth. So at some point in the not so distant future, if I were to continue graphing this for different values of x that are larger, function b is going to rapidly overtake function a. And what that looks like in this context is quantities for function b will eventually exceed the quantities for function a. So that completes question number 12. Unlucky number 13, we have a survey of 3260 people. 57% of people said they spend more than two hours a day on their smartphones. The margin of error is plus or minus 2.2%. This survey is then extrapolated to 17247. And they're saying, based on the survey, what is the estimated minimum and maximum number of people in the town who spend more than two hours a day on their smartphones? So let's look at this question. It has a couple moving parts. So I have plus or minus 2.2% error, which means that my 57% could be as low as 57, whoops, 57 minus 2.2% which is 54.8%. And the max is that 57 number plus 2.2, which is 59.2%. 
if I want to write these numbers, write these, sorry, write these percentages as numbers, this is going to be, if I move that decimal two to the left, I'm going to get 0 0.548. And if I perform the same procedure here, I'm going to get 0 0.5. 5.92. So now all I have to do is take these values, which are the minimum and maximum percentages adjusted for the margin of error, and I just have to multiply them by my new data set. So my minimum should be that 17.247 number times the minimum percentage, which I've determined is 0 0.548. And the same thing, that initial data set of 17,247 times the potential maximum, which is 0 0.592. And I am going to, what, is it, what am I being asked here? Round answers to the nearest whole numbers. So I am going to go to my calculator and I am going to do this math because as good as I am at math, I am not capable of that multiplication problem off the top of my head. And for the minimum, I'm going to get 945. And let me redo this for the maximum number. And I have 10 to, what did I do wrong? Something looks wacky here. Oops, I forgot. Okay, the actual minimum is 9451.3. So that was a calculation error but I've fixed it and now we have the correct totals for uh, both of these guys let me verify that other number real fast okay yep so barring any calculation errors on the user end you get 9451 as the nearest whole number for the minimum and 10 to 10 for the maximum so this is a good, um, this actually serves as a good example. Um, the reason I was able to tell that this did not look correct was because I got my original calculator error led me to 945, which in my head I could, I was thinking, okay, 945 is about a thousand and 17,000, if I start canceling zeros, 1 over 17, this number is about 1 over 17, and my actual value that I'm multiplying is greater than 1 over 2. So 1 over 17 and 1 over 2 are not even remotely close, so I th that was how I, in my head, kind of figured out that, hey, something might be wrong here, and I was able to go back. So. Um, I'm just kind of advocating here for sanity checks. When you're doing especially complicated calculator questions, try to have an idea of what you expect to see when you hit the enter button on your calculator. Because if you have no idea what to expect, no matter what the answer is, there's no kind of, I would describe it as a, uh, like a spell check going on. You need to be kind of thinking, hey, does this answer make sense? Does this answer make sense? And that way, when you get an answer like 950-ish, you can say, hey, I need to figure out what I did wrong. Uh, and I caught myself and was able to correct it. But it's entirely possible if you didn't know what to expect here, you could have gotten 945 and just said, okay, that's what the calculator says. Time to put it down and move on. And you'll lose points on something as simple as typing something incorrectly on the calculator. So just make sure that when you're going through the test, especially when it comes to calculator, just know what to expect when you start answering the question at the end. So 
Okay, that was a good little learning experience. Let's go on to question number 14 as we make progress. We're almost done. And I forgot that this is the 13 question exam, so that's it. Um, hopefully you got a lot out of that exam review. Um, please stay tuned and subscribe. This is the first of a few reviews that are going to come out for algebra. Um, this is primarily the long form centralized EOC review. I wanted to keep the whole official Florida Department of Education EOC review in one video, but like you can see here, uh, that makes the video run pretty long. Future videos should be shorter form. I'm thinking four to five questions and around 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, and I'm gonna be posting those probably every other day, at least until the exam happens in a month. Um, and the goal is to help you guys better prepare for the exam, and not only the EOC, but potentially for any Algebra 1 final exams that, have, uh, that you have coming. Um, this test material is suited for that as well. So um, feel free to, like I said, subscribe, come back, and um, the best way to study with a resource like this is to watch the video, and when I start a question, hit pause, go do the question on your own, and come back and see if we got the same answer and if we did the same thing. And if there was some discrepancy if we did something different between your work and my work, see what went wrong. And like I said, I tend to explain in great detail when I'm doing these, so you can get an idea of what went wrong and how to fix it. Um, if you appreciated this video but feel like you could use some extra help and you feel like supporting me as well, I've started a Patreon page. Um, here you can access a direct email hotline for any questions. Um, anything like homework review, EOC, if you have a practice exam that you're not sure how to start a question on or not sure why your answer is different than an answer key, stuff like that, that's what this direct email hotline is for. Um, so, and I'll provide a detailed report for any question that you send uh, and try to help you under, understand the material the best I can. Uh, so, like I said, patreon.com slash simplify stem on the screen it's also in the description feel free to go over there and check it out um, currently the video repository is small on patreon because we just started um, but we're going to be growing quickly and getting some great videos on that site uh, the primary benefit right now of course is just that email hotline so um, another thing to mention is with you guys being in algebra one right now geometry is next semester having a resource like this for geometry with the email hotline combined with the future video repository that's coming is going to be a great asset to help learn that material. Um, but all that being said, like I said, initially please stay tuned on this channel, get subscribed for a lot more EOC review material, and have a good rest of your day, and good luck on the EOC exam.